Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing hyperbilirubinemia, and so hopefully by the end of this video you will have a better understanding of bilirubin metabolism as well as how to identify the site of pathology when dealing with a case of hyperbilirubinemia. So let's get to it. Let's start off by talking about bilirubin metabolism as well as the steps that are involved. First, we start with production of bilirubin, which we'll talk about in more detail and then uptake of bilirubin by the hepatocyte, leading to conjugation and then excretion into bile ducts, and then eventual delivery to the intestine. Okay, so let's start with bilirubin production, which is our first step. Bilirubin is actually formed by heme breakdown. Most of our heme is actually found in hemoglobin, which is where about 80% of daily bilirubin production is derived from. If you remember, hemoglobin breaks down to heme and globin. And hemoglobin is found in red blood cells, where it helps with oxygen delivery to tissues. And about every 120 days or so, red blood cells that are old get broken down and recycled. This is done mainly by phagocytes known as macrophages that are found in the spleen as well as the bone marrow. And this group of macrophages that are responsible for the breakdown of red blood cells are actually referred to as the reticuloendothelial system, so just keep this in mind because I will mention this in the next few slides. So this slide is going to discuss how bilirubin metabolism actually takes place. And as I already mentioned, we start with heme, which is derived from your hemoglobin, and this actually gets converted to biliverdin by heme oxygenase. Biliverdin is then converted to unconjugated bilirubin by biliverdin reductase. Now keep in mind that the box that contains these steps is labeled as macrophage because this breakdown is all taking place within the macrophage and through the reticuloendothelial system. Next, our unconjugated bilirubin goes into the circulation where it is bound by albumin. And this is important to know because unconjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble. So it cannot travel through the circulation on its own. It needs to be bound by albumin. The unconjugated bilirubin is then taken up by the hepatocytes where it will undergo conjugation. And this is done through UDP glucuronal transferase. Try to say that a few times. And unlike the unconjugated bilirubin, the conjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble. So it does not need to be bound by albumin here. This conjugated bilirubin is then excreted into the bile ducts and then enters the intestine. And then in the intestine, there are actually a series of conversions and steps that take place here, but I am going to just summarize it briefly for what you really need to know. With the help of bacterial enzymes, conjugated bilirubin is converted into urobilinogen, and the majority of this is actually excreted into the feces as stercobilin, and this actually has a brownish pigment that gives feces its brownish color. A small amount of this urobilinogen is reabsorbed by the intestine and returned to the liver where it undergoes reconjugation and then re-excretion into the intestine, known as our enterohepatic circulation. But another thing to know is that some of this reabsorbed urobilinogen is actually excreted in the urine in the form of urobilin, and this urobilin actually has a yellowish pigment which gives urine its yellowish color. So it's really interesting when you look at the whole process of bilirubin metabolism to see how it ends up in different places and how different things like feces and urine get their own distinctive color. And I wouldn't stress too much about knowing the different enzymes unless you're taking really step one, but overall, just understand the overall mechanism of what happens once heme is broken down. All right, so let's talk about jaundice, which is when you have an elevated bilirubin in the blood. And I like to break this down into three different categories, your prehepatic jaundice, your intrahepatic jaundice, and your posthepatic jaundice. So let's go through each of these. Let's talk about prehepatic jaundice first, and this is what happens when you have excessive red blood cell breakdown. And this will lead to an increase in heme concentration and subsequently an increase in bilirubin. And what happens here is we have an increase in unconjugated bilirubin that overwhelms the liver's ability to conjugate. And so, if you think about it, you get an increase in unconjugated bilirubin here. And so you might be wondering, what are situations in which we would get an excessive red blood cell breakdown? This would happen with hemolytic anemia, and there are many different types of this. Another situation that you might encounter are with some genetic conditions in which we have impaired conjugation due to a deficient amount of UDP glucuronal transferase, which, if you remember, is the enzyme responsible for conjugating bilirubin. And the two situations in which you'll see this are with Jolbert syndrome, which is a milder form because you have a decreased amount of UDP glucuronal transferase. The more severe form is known as krigler najjar because there is actually an absent amount of UDP glucuronal transferase, so it has a very poor prognosis overall. 
Let's now talk about post-hepatic jaundice, which is where you have an obstruction of biliary drainage. This can be due to intraluminal causes or something inside the lumen of the duct, like gallstones. There can also be intramural causes, which is when you have an issue involving the lining of the duct, like with strictures or cholangeal carcinoma. And finally, you can have extramural causes, which is when there is something outside of the duct, but that still affects the duct itself. And we can see this with things like tumors, particularly pancreatic head tumors, as well as other masses like lymphoma. And now let's move on to intrahepatic jaundice, which I'd like you to think of as a mixed picture of prehepatic and posthepatic. And this is because you get a dysfunction of hepatic cells, which leads to impaired conjugation, and therefore you can get an increase in your unconjugated bilirubin. But at the same time, you can also have a compression of the intrahepatic biliary ducts, which leads to impaired excretion, even after conjugation has taken place. And so in this case, you would also have an elevated conjugated bilirubin. So you have a mix of both elevated unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin. And this next slide is a summary of different causes of prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic jaundice. And so this is really more for your own review. And now, as we always do, we will end with a practice question. But this time, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to present you with three different practice questions to fit the different categories of jaundice that we discussed. So there will be one case of prehepatic, one case of intrahepatic, and one case of posthepatic jaundice. I will list the correct answer choices in the video description below, and I will make a separate video in the next few days where I will discuss the explanation behind each of these questions and how to get to the right answer choice. I really hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe. It just really helps us keep doing what we're doing. And as always, good luck studying everyone.